so with that, I would like to welcome Professor Seth Bordenstein as our speaker for the Center for Viral Research here at the University of California, Irvine today. And um, anyway, it is an enormous honor uh, and a welcome distraction to have the pleasure of introducing Professor Seth Bordenstein. He has been thoughtfully engaged in the field of endosymbiosis for more than 20 years. He got his bachelor's in biology in ecology and evolution from the University of Rochester, followed by a master's degree and a PhD. And his first publication focused on the effects of Wolbachia and interspecies cytoplasmic incompatibility was in 1998. So talk about persistence. <laughs> He's really been contributing to this field for a long time. Um, and that was just shortly after he received his undergraduate degree. And he's a big proponent of undergraduate research. I think he has more than 15 publications with undergraduate researchers. Uh, he proceeded to a postdoc at the Marine Biological Lab in Wids Hole, where he first became a PI. And then he moved to Vanderbilt as an assistant professor in 2008. Now he's full professor, Centennial Endowed Chair and Director of the Vanderbilt Microbiome Initiative there. Um, and he has now published more than 100 papers, and as I mentioned, at least 15 of them are with undergrads, and I've had the chance to meet his lab in Vanderbilt and talk to the undergrads who really are engaged in the science. Um, and his papers often have a real sense of how they're gonna impact society. He's really thinking about the big picture. Um, Seth has been an important colleague to me in several different stages of my career. I remember loving his lab's website as a postdoc and seeing him as an ambassador to our field of the microbiome and the ideas of phylosymbiosis. He's just an incredibly positive force in our field. And um, as a fellow microbiome center director, we've swapped notes on how to help campuses get their microbiome research done. And he's been a really important influence on me that way. I had the opportunity to visit Vanderbilt pre-COVID, obviously, maybe the year before last. Um, and I was just received really warmly there. I had a lot of memorable conversations with colleagues there. I got to have Nashville hot chicken, of course. Um, and I even got to join a lab meeting. He sent me home with boxes of moon pies from Nashville <laughs> that my lab loved. And I wish we could reciprocate with an actual visit and share the beaches of Southern California with you. So I hope that happens soon. And we are really looking forward to your talk. So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Katrina. That was a wonderful introduction. It is good to see you. Uh, you're one of my favorite people in the world. And it's good <laughs> to see everybody else. Um, and I think there are moon pies for everybody after this talk. So let's <laughs> and get started. Um, it's a good pleasure to be here and to talk with uh, a diverse group of folks thinking about viruses, ecology, evolution, microbes. Um, and uh, so feel free to, to think about what I have to share and ask questions. Uh, the title of the talk is An Endosymbiotic Pandemic Spurred by Phage Genes That Selfishly Hijack Reproduction. Now, before COVID, I used to ask, what do people think of when they think of a pandemic? Um, and COVID was not on the list, but it, of course, now is. It is a raging pandemic. Uh, most often, we refer to the 1918-1919 flu pandemic. Uh, which infected about 500 million people, at least that's the estimates. And currently we have about 47 million plus cases of, of coronavirus, COVID, uh, and that is increasing daily. Um, this is a pandemic that infects one species, as far as we know, or we're considering it as a pandemic. Um, and I'd like to talk to you about a, another pandemic in, in another world of the animal kingdom, um, and shine a little light on what we know about that and why it was so successful and how we can use it. Um, and that pandemic is known as Wolbachia. And Wolbachia is a genus of alpha proteobacteria. Uh, 1918 flu pandemic, and then six years later, the discovery of Wolbachia by Dr. Herti Dr. Wolbach, uh, Simon Wolbach, who was at Harvard University, and his graduate student, Marshall Hertig. And um, they didn't know it was a pandemic at the time. They were cracking open lots of arthropods and mosquitoes and ripping open their abdomens and doing transmission electron microscopy and started to see these rod-shaped bacteria. And they had this prediction in their article in 1924 that these bacteria were found in a few different insect species. They may be common. Um, little did they know that Wolbach himself right here would be named uh, after the bacteria. And that about 20 years ago, we started to see PCR surveys show that Wolbachia occurs in an estimated 40% of all arthropod species. 
Now, arthropods represent 85% of all animal species. So we're talking about millions and millions of arthropod species, animal species, uh, infected and carrying this Wolbachia bacteria. And within a species, the infection frequency may be low or it may be quite high. But just thinking about a global diversity pandemic, Wolbachia is truly a great pandemic in that view. So this is a video of an organism that we study in our lab. It's a Nisonia parasitoid wasp. Um, this individual is a male and he's grooming himself and he will be courting and mating with a female as the video goes on. Now, if we were to rip open the abdomens of these Nasonia, much like Hertig and Wolbach did, um, we would also find Wolbachia, this sort of uninteresting, granular looking bacteria. It can be rod shaped, sometimes it doesn't look as much of a rod as it does a circle or a sphere. And you'll notice there are multiple membranes around this endosymbiotic bacteria. That's because it lives in the cells uh, inside the reproductive tissues of their hosts and they encapsulate with multiple membranes around them. Now we can visualize these bacteria by microscopy. Um, these are fluorescently labeled Wolbachia in red in the testes where Wolbachia infect uh, primarily, as well as in the ovaries. So it's a reproductive bacteria. Um, and here the Wolbachia are stained in orange. Wolbachia are principally germline microbes, germline germs. Now they can occur quite commonly in somatic cells and tissues, but they concentrate in the reproductive tissues. And there we go, there's a, there's a mating and a fertilization of these wasps and then a little more courtship and they will uh, go off and find other mates or lay their eggs. So these Nisonia wasps are not what I'll talk about today, but they're one of the standard organisms we do study Wolbachia with. As I mentioned, Wolbachia are in the reproductive tissues, and this is an embryo of the wasp. And in green are the Wolbachia bacteria, the sort of cocktail that's been transmitted in the mother's ovaries to the developing oocytes. So it's transovarial transmission of this endosymbiont. And then in blue are the mitotically dividing host DNA, host chromosomes of the wasp. Now, Wolbachia has become popular in the last decade or two uh, for two main reasons, although there are many. One is which is you may have heard of it as uh, one of the best tools to date of controlling arthropod vectors of disease, such as mosquitoes or other pests. Uh, and in this case, the World Mosquito Program run out of Australia um, has had the ability to take a Wolbachia strain from Drosophila melanogaster, W. Mel from melanogaster, put it into Aedes aegypti mosquitoes that transmit various viruses like Zika and Dengue virus. And what happens is, is the Wolbachia presence somehow inhibits the replication of the viruses, particularly and especially in the salivary glands of these mosquitoes. And the benefit of this sort of immunization, if you will, is that when a mosquito bites and it has Wolbachia, it has very little virus. Um, if the mosquito has no Wolbachia but has the virus, of course the virus transmits. So this is a wonderful tool to conceivably transform populations that in gray here lack Wolbachia but transmit the disease. And then over time, if you spread these Wolbachia infected mosquitoes and they start to spread themselves, ultimately you can do a population replacement where the mosquito species or these Aedes aegypti mosquitoes no longer transmit the virus to humans. Um, this sounds like science fiction. Um, I used to go to conferences 25 years ago and would hear people talk about this idea, but I'm pleased to say today that many of the efforts talked about are now in implementation in pilot studies around the world. Um, this is another case of uh, the World Mosquito Program now releasing these Wolbachia infected mosquitoes in 12 or more countries. Um, they started off in Australia in the northeastern Queensland area right here. And uh, tracking over the last decade or two has shown that in black, there are these tick marks of locally acquired dengue cases. And you can see they decline right about here. And there's very little ticking going on. There's very little dengue cases. At the same time, these Wolbachia infected mosquitoes in green were, were released and increasing in frequency. Um, and so it looks like that there is a marked success in releasing the mosquitoes into the wild and then reducing the dengue transmission. And this should also affect Zika transmission and chikungunya virus, uh, virus uh, transmission as well. So these types of studies are now ongoing around the world. Another reason that Wolbachia is extremely interesting to the basic biologist is that they mess with reproduction. They cause various sexual shenanigans that modify insect gametes or arthropod gametes or embryos themselves. Um, and in some ways, these reproductive modifications induced by the Wolbachia symbionts 
can prevent species from interbreeding. And so when I was a graduate student a long, long time ago, um, that's exactly what I was studying. I took two species of these in the Sonia wasps. They had different Wolbachia, and because they modify their gametes in different ways, we couldn't interbreed these Wolbachia-infected wasps. But if you antibiotically cure the wasps, they can interbreed once again, and ultimately, um, they are no longer a good species, if you will, once cured of their Wolbachia infections. So it's an excellent case of uh, symbiosis uh, and speciation. Many other tangential or good cases listed on the right here. Now, why do Wolbachia spread in mosquitoes? Why are they being utilized in these control programs? And then how do they affect these uh, sort of amazing evolutionary processes that traditionally are not in the domain of symbionts? And one of Wolbachia's greatest weapons uh, by which it contributes to these processes is known as cytoplasmic incompatibility. That's a mouthful. So cytoplasmic because the Wolbachia live in the cytoplasm of their host cells and incompatibility for the reasons I'm going to describe in this Punnett square. And this is really important. So please follow along and make sure it's understandable. If not, ask a question. Um, essentially, an infected male colored in crossed to an uninfected female produces inviable dead offspring. But an infected male crossed to an infected female produces infected offspring because mom transmits the bacteria maternally from mother to offspring via that transoviral transmission. The self crosses are compatible here and here, and then this cross of an uninfected male to an infected female is compatible as well. But what I want you to notice is what the incompatibility does between the infected male and the uninfected female is it reduces the relative fitness of these uninfected females. They produce less offspring than the infected females who produce essentially twice as many offspring in this graph. So the benefit of this selfish phenotype, because Wolbachia are modifying the reproduction, is they gain a transmission advantage being maternally inherited to the next generation. It is truly the epitome of a selfish adaptation uh, induced by this intracellular endosymbiont. How do these embryos die in this particular CI cross, which I'll use for uh, short CI? Um, in a normal first mitosis of a fertilized egg that is compatible, uh, maternal and paternal chromatin properly divide. But in a fertilized embryo experiencing CI, you can see something different happening here. In the middle is a paternal chromatin bridge. This is paternal DNA being shredded during the first mitotic division. And as you can imagine, that might lead to aneuploidy and eventual lethality of the embryo. And that's certainly one of the traits we see essentially the embryo rests uh, right at the first mitosis due to this problem. We can also see uh, developmental issues accruing past that first mitosis. So this is a CI embryo, and what you can plainly miss is the amount of mitotic divisions happening in the lower portion of the embryo here. So this embryo is arrested, but it didn't complete mitosis. There are missing areas of mitosis, um, and clearly this embryo is going to die as well. Okay, so that's what is underneath the hood of CI to some degree, but we have not known the genetic basis of these types of cunning modifications that have enabled the World Mosquito Program. There's a Kentucky company called Mosquito Mate right in my backyard that's doing these releases. Uh, Google's spin-off company Verily is all, all, all involved in these mosquito releases. These companies are all using CI to control mosquito vectors. And then as I mentioned, the CI phenotype can potentially assist speciation in a variety of arthropods. So what are the genes that underpin this pandemic, these applications, and then these evolutionary outcomes? Um, that has been one of the big questions in the field. And there was no precedent. Um, and early on, um, we were thinking about bacteriophages because Wolbachia were known to harbor a bacteriophage as a potential candidate for carrying the genes that cause cytoplasmic incompatibility. This is Michelle Marshall. She did some beautiful transmission electron microscopy of Wolbachia. And you can make out the uh, membrane of Wolbachia here. And as it goes around and loops around, it kind of stops. And that's because these phage particles have localized to this end of the embryo, uh, this end of Wolbachia, and are now moving, you can sort of imagine this, outside of the cell, moving beyond the cell as they undergo lysis. Uh, this is a clean Wolbachia. It's phage free. It shows no evidence of particle formation, and the membranes are intact, multiple membranes. Right above it is another Wolbachia cell undergoing phage lysis. Uh, what you can see are the problems are that the phage particles are kind of migrating or moving their way out to the membranes. There is, in fact, an inner membrane that has collapsed here, which is typical of phage lysis. And then this pycnotic DNA or densely, densely degraded DNA that's indicative of phage lysis. 
Once these particles are out, they can be found in the uh, extracellular tissue matrix uh, inside the reproductive tissues. This is in the testes in this case. So these phage particle uh, packets are, are floating around. Okay, so there is a phage and it's temperate. So the prophage inserts into the genome of Wolbachia. And that was discovered in 2004 when the first Wolbachia genome sequence, sequence from Wolbachia uh, in Melanogaster was, was sequenced. We were able to do a comparative analysis of many strains to that reference strain from Melanogaster and found that the hotspot of genome evolution, where these red and, green, or red and blue marks are, tend to coincide with where the prophage is. Um, and so these blue and red marks indicate divergent or absent genes, and you can see the cluster of where the pink prophage regions are labeled. Anywhere between 20 to 87% of the divergent or absent genes can be mapped to this region, depending upon the strain we're comparing. Now, this is a well-known phenomena in free-living bacteria, that phages experience marked rates of recombination, insertions, deletions, um, and they do tend to be hotspots of genome evolution in free living bacteria. This was the first time we got to see that in an endosymbiont that lives inside host cells, the same dynamics are occurring. So I increasingly think of Wolbachia's genome, although small, as a bit like a free living bacterial genome. Now, um, subsequently to that, and just a few years ago, Sarah was able to purify out the phage woe particles for the first time and sequence the genome of the phage particles. And what we discovered was something unexpected. Um, the annotations of the prophage were smaller in the reference Wolbachia genomes than we actually knew, because what we newly discovered was a module of genes, which we've termed the eukaryotic association module. Um, this is a long module, can sometimes comprise more than half, sometimes up to 70% of the phage genome. Um, relative to the core genes, which we would define as core structural genes, base plate genes, tail genes, et cetera. So this EAM for short, this eukaryotic association module, now had to be lumped into the annotation of the entire prophage, the entire phage flow genome. This was an important step because as you notice, there's two pink genes up here that we're gonna talk a lot about in just a second in the eukaryotic association module. What else is there though? What's in this EAM? Well, one of the largest phage genes to date is in this EAM, and it's a eukaryotic-like sized gene. Um, and there are all sorts of potential host microbe interaction genes or proteins in the EAM. And what really struck us is that a number of these labeled in orange annotate to eukaryotic genomes, to arthropod genomes. Um, and the suggestion then to us was that perhaps there was a novel information flow of genes from arthropods, animals, to the phage genome. And maybe this was a way for the phage to fill its arsenal of genes it needs to operate in an arthropod world because the phage not only lives in Wolbachia, but it lives in the arthropod since once Wolbachia is lysed, the arthropod cell is left over. Um, here's a phylogenetic case of why we think there's been horizontal gene transfer between phages and arthropods. Uh, so this is a phylogeny built off of the latrotoxin C-terminal domain. Now the latrotoxin is typically encoded by black widows, brown widows, uh, and shown on the, this side of the phylogeny here. It only occurs in black widows and brown widows. Um, but when we picked up a signal of it in the phage woe genome, you can see the phage woe homology all over here. There's nothing in between. It's just the black widows and the brown widows, and then the phage woe snippet of DNA that maps back to this latrotoxin C-terminal domain. There is a marked divergence between them. Um, so it's a putative transfer, but based on the evidence to date, we think, it's, we think it's a pretty good case. Now, the latrotoxin is used as the venom toxin to degrade target insect cells that these uh, spiders might be eating. And that biologically could potentially be of interest since the phage has to not only live in a Wolbachia world, but an animal cell world. And maybe it uses these types of insecticidal genes as a way to make a living. I'll come back to that later. Getting back to the core question about CI, um, the EAM comes back to the central spot because for a while in the literature, um, before we knew the genes, there was speculation of correlations in which various genes in the eukaryotic association module were candidates for causing cytoplasmic incompatibility, transcriptional regulators, and then this ULP1 peptidase or protease protein. And this work was uh, done by several of our Wolbachia colleagues. 
Uh, and we were extremely interested because these genes map to the EAM region and could put the phage back in play as a, as a factor for driving the induction of cytoplasmic incompatibility. We took an unbiased approach, though, to ultimately get to that conclusion. So Jason and Sarah did a multiomic analysis of strains that cause CI, strains that do not cause CI, transcriptomes, and proteomes. And to make a long story short, the two genes that associated with uh, the cytoplasmic incompatibility happen to be, so these two genes here that fit all the criteria, happen to be CIF-A and CIF-B in the eukaryotic association module. Um, CIF-A and CIF-B are defined as cytoplasmic incompatibility factors A and B. These are adjacent genes and they're strictly associated with the phage woe genome or relics of the phage woe genome. To this point, we don't know if they're causal, we just have a genomic multi-omic association of these two genes that make proteins. Um, we built a phylogenetic tree of CIF-A and CIF-B based on their protein sequences, and they were a mirror image of each other. So there are a couple main groups of the phage wo uh, CIF-A variants and CIF-B variants, and taxa for taxa, there's complete correspondence between the CIF-A gene and the CIF-B gene. So this might suggest that these mirror images of each other would imply that they function together, they work together, and these are also adjacent genes. Um, the annotations are listed below. So in CIF-A, there's a catalase rel domain, uh, predicted at least, and it's an antioxidant predicted domain, a domain of unknown function, and then an STE transcriptional regulator gene. All of these are predicted, none have been validated. Um, on CIF-B, a much bigger protein, uh, we have two nuclease domains that are in the PDD-EXK family. So here and here, nuclease domains are of interest because they nick DNA. And as we were looking at some of those chromatin errors, perhaps the nuclease domains are involved in that. Um, and then there's this protease domain, this ULP1 domain. Um, and, and functional validation now has confirmed that mutations throughout both of these proteins and in several of these domains, all contribute to either CI or rescue, and I'll talk about that in a minute. How do we do this work? How are we going to evaluate these two candidate genes that popped out? Now, Wolbachia is not genetically editable, so we had to figure out a heterologous expression system. The beauty is that if you work in Melanogaster, which naturally harbors Wolbachia, you can use what's called the UAS GAL4 system to express these phage genes heterologously in the Melanogaster genome and see if you can recapitulate the cytoplasmic incompatibility problem. So above the skull is an infected male, but if we swap that infected male with an uninfected male that expresses either CIF-A or CIF-B or both, perhaps we can recapitulate the phenotype um, that was uh, predicted from some of these association studies. So this is how it works. There's a promoter that's tissue specific and we're expressing our gene products in the reproductive tissues. That drives GAL4, and GAL4 binds to an upstream activating sequence, or UAS, and then launches the CIF-A or CIF-B transgene product into the reproductive tissues. By doing so, um, we then had a team of undergrads and grad students uh, see if we could uh, test this hypothesis. So again, here are the Punnett squared dynamics. Um, I'm going to color code the CI and rescue crosses in red and blue. Um, here's a control CI cross that shows embryonic inviability. It's the way we measure CI. These embryos are dying. Um, so we're scoring the number of embryos that live versus the number of embryos that die. And if you express CIF-A by itself in an uninfected male, you get a compatible cross and no CI cross. So embryonic viability of these Drosophila flies is quite high. So A alone doesn't cause CI, B alone doesn't cause CI. And then we were about to stop the work until the last minute and we had a thought that we should have thought of this earlier, which is the A and B genes should be expressed together to potentially recapitulate the CI trait. And that's exactly what we've done. And you can see that there's very strong CI here upon co-expression of the A and B products together uh, in, in these males. And importantly to us, a key cross is that these transgene induced death of the embryos could be rescued by infected females because that's normally what happens in CI. And it could be that by expressing phage genes in a Drosophila male, you induce sperm artifacts that cause sterility. Um, it's clearly not an artifact because the infection, the Wolbachia infection in the embryos or in the females can recognize that modification and rescue it to be compatible. Okay, so CIF-A and B together cause CI. 
um, to kind of convince ourselves that we were on the right track. We took advantage of the fact that infected males who are old, these aged males, express lower levels of CI than is normal. Um, and that's shown right here. These aged males have a very variable degree of CI. And our hypothesis was if we co-expressed A and B in an infected male, maybe we could dial in the amount of uh, CI protein product and increase the amount of embryonic death. Our control crosses are on the bottom. So we add CIF A and that pushes the CI levels down further, more embryonic death. About the same for expressing CIF B in an infected male and then expressing both together kind of dialed it up as most as we could in these aged males and increases that embryonic death even more. Um, so this kind of put at least the, these transgenic studies in, in the context of we're probably on the right track for identifying the CI genes in the absence of being able to knock them out. Because remember, these are all um, correlative studies with heterologous expression, um, not exactly the same as knocking out a gene. But this evidence was building that we're on the right track. And the uh, other aspect is that we had mentioned these embryonic defects that typically occur in CI embryos. So what I'm showing on the top is control embryos. And then on the bottom are CI embryos, representative ones. Um, and you can see there's these early mitotic failures. Uh, there's chromatin bridging zoomed in here. And then there's this regional failure, uh, as we saw earlier, with mitoses that should be throughout the embryo just aren't. And that's in contrast to a normally dividing embryo here and here, and then an unfertilized embryo shown here with just the female chromosomes. So we scored all this in our transgenic uh, data. So again, we recapitulate the phenotype and then score these defects. And just to highlight what is most important, the CI cross normally and the transgenic CI cross both have an elevated amount of embryonic death in these orange and red bars. Um, and these embryonic death events coincide with the cytological defects described earlier. So we can recapitulate the death, we can recapitulate the cytological defects, and we can recapitulate the rescue that normally happens. As shown here, we have more compatible and viable embryos. Okay, so CIF A and CIF B cause CI on the male side. The other half of the equation though is what happens on the female side, because remember there's this rescue aspect of it. Um, and for a while we were thinking, maybe there are different genes that do the rescue and we've got a lot more work ahead of us. But the first thing to try is that the comparative multi-omic analysis only came up with CIF-A and CIF-B as associating with CI and rescue. So why not try these first? And that's exactly uh, what we did next. So instead of expressing in the male, we're now expressing in the uninfected female and asking in a normal CI male with a wild type Wolbachia, does it cause CI? And if it does cause CI, can the transgenic products rescue it? And of course, this would be an uninfected set of offspring here if we're using uninfected uh, transgenic flies. Okay, so control crosses on top and bottom, CI and rescue on the top and bottom, express CIF B, it's still CI, no rescue, express CIF A, no rescue, and express both together, no rescue. This was a failed experiment. And right about here is a good lesson for trainees um, that we were about to give up, except we all kind of noticed this uptick here. This CIF A transgenic female had slightly more rescue, slightly more embryonic viability than the CIF Bs or the CIF ABs. So this made us think a little harder about how to assess this more carefully. We did not give up, especially since the multiomics said, just look at these genes. And in fact, what we knew already was that CIF A expression is much higher than CIF B expression naturally in the, in the prophage state of the Wolbachia. And we've based that on qPCR data from our lab, as well as transcriptome data that was analyzed by uh, Amelia Lindsay and Irene Newton, our colleagues. So CIF A has a lot more expression than CIF B. This made us think maybe we just need to express CIF A a bit more in the transgenic system. So NOS is um, one promoter, and MTD has three promoters, all driving in the reproductive tissues. So the prediction then is if you drive with more promoters in the same area, you get more product. And indeed, in our case, you get more rescue. So under NOS expression, the one promoter, not any rescue, under multiple promoters driving in the reproductive tissues, you do get rescue. And we confirmed that we increased expression orders of magnitude higher uh, when using the MTD uh, transgene uh, and promoter system. Okay, 
What about the cytological defects? Um, so I just want you to focus on the scoring again. The reds are the, the lethal defects and the other two are just kind of normal or unfertilized. Um, and then focus your eyes here. These are all the rescue crosses. Above it are the CI crosses. And the rescue crosses, whenever A is present here, or even in the dual case here, you can see a, a, a decrease in the amount of red lethal defects and an increase in the amount of uh, what we think are normal developing healthy embryos. So the rescue gene for CIF-A, and CIF-A alone, you do not need B with it, and it doesn't hurt it either, um, can recapitulate the recovery of these cytological defects. Okay, so just to sum up where we are, um, we have a fly with a very tiny Wolbachia genome. In that tiny Wolbachia genome from Drosophila are a prophage, and you can have multiple prophage regions per genome with multiple CIF genes. Um, the identification of the eukaryotic association module is a really interesting feature to us, and in that module are the two genes CIF-A and CIF-B with various predicted or validated domains. And ultimately, these genes contribute to what are these great success stories or biological stories of mosquito control and arthropod speciation. The final thing, um, to put the whole system together, by removing Wolbachia altogether, by removing the phage genome altogether, was to just do the experiment with the transgenes alone, on the male side and on the female side. And this is what led to Dylan and I's um, uh, coining of the two by one genetic model of CI. That is two genes cause CI, one gene rescues it. We should be able to engineer flies with only these genes. Up at top are the control CI crosses and on the bottom are the rescue crosses. And right in the middle here, just focus your eyes on this cross because it gets a little complicated. This is the cross that's highlighted in the two by one model. The CIF-A, CIF-B expression in male and CIF-A rescue in female. And indeed that's a compatible rescue cross. Um, and I think this is the first time that we could sort of engineer animal reproduction completely based on phage genes. Uh, two, two genes in the male, one gene in the female. Um, and, and these flies now depend on these phage genes the way we've engineered them. Okay, so given where the system is, we now have the potential to keep going down in a reductionist way into the essential sites and regions of the CIF-A and CIF-B proteins uh, in the genes themselves. And we've been doing what we call evolution-guided mutagenesis. It's actually a term we picked up from Harmeet Malik, one of our colleagues in the field. Um, and what we've done is just looked at conserved areas um, throughout these key domains of CIF-A and CIF-B. In this case, we're just showing CIF-A. And there's, you know, marked variation in conservation, but we specifically selected amino acid sites that were 100% conserved. And then we mutated them to alanines. And then we created four lines, essentially. Line one has these two substitutions in the conserved sites, line two, and so forth. Um, so these are com mostly combinatorial uh, mutagenic uh, attempts where we're doing multiple uh, substitutions in one particular region. And what, to sum up a long story, I'm not going to show you all the data. If we knock out um, these two sites or we change these two sites, um, rescue is lost. Okay, so these, these sites specifically function on the rescue side of CI. And the other sites over here, I'm not showing an error on them. That's because they had no effect on rescue. We changed them, but there was no effect on rescue. And then on the CI side, you'll see that we also show that these same two sites that were involved in rescue or regions are also involved in CI. So there's a duality here. The protein, that five prime half of the protein is functioning both in terms of CI and in rescue. And then there's a third region, which is new to CI, the CI side, in which we could ablate CI without ablating rescue. It appears to be a CI specific region that maps to these various domains. Um, so this is the first time we were able to get down to sort of CIF-A site effects on CI and what contributes to CI and what contributes to rescue. For CIF-B, CIF-B, remember, only works on the male side. It's not needed on the female side. So CIF-B is only involved in CI. And when we knock out sites on CIF-B or change sites in CIF-B, we ablate CI in every single case. Okay, So the whole protein is necessary in all the regions we've hit are necessary for the, its role in, in the inducing CI, particularly the conserved sites. We don't know necessarily what the um, less conserved sites uh, do. Okay, so the thing that's perplexing, most perplexing to me and that we eventually want to figure out is, how does the CIF-A gene function in CI and rescue? How does it play both sides? 
And there are two basic possibilities here. One is it has multiple functions. So on the sperm side, on the male side, CIF A has a different function than what CIF A does on the female side. In that sense, it could play roles in both CI and rescue. It could have a tissue specific role. Post-translational modifications are different in testes versus eggs or embryos. Um, and that CIF A's function could change when in the presence of CIF B. But in the absence of CIF B, maybe CIF A does something different. This is the, the game we're now trying to resolve and think about what the next steps are. Um, the other way is that CIF A is one function only and it plays that same function on both sides. And this is the most parsimonious argument. The CIF A does the same thing on both sides. Um, so we could consider it a sort of master switch for CI and rescue. It interacts with the same target, it does the same thing, and ultimately CIF B could just be this male accessory protein assisting CIF A's function in the sperm and in the embryo, or in the sperm specifically, but not in the embryo. Um, and that's one reason that may be is that the embryo is fundamentally a different set of DNA uh, and cell membranes and processes than what's happening on the male side in spermatogenesis in the testes. So CIF-B could be this sort of male specific assister, if you will. Um, we're still figuring that out and look forward to talking to folks about that if they have any thoughts. Um, I'm gonna sort of wrap up the genetic work with a serendipitous tale. Um, and this happens every so often, maybe once every 10 or 20 years in the lab. And PIs might be able to attest to this. Students, it experiences, it can happen, but it's very slow. And this is one of those stories. So a few genes away from the CIF genes is a gene called WMK. And we've termed that WO mediated killing. It's essentially a hop, skip and a jump away. And it encodes two helix turn helix domains, predicted domains, and these would then be involved in DNA binding. You'll notice these predictions aren't terribly strong, but not awful either. Um, so it could be a DNA binding protein. And why we call it WO-mediated killing is because we've been able to link it to a male killing phenotype. And the male killing phenotype is another adaptation that Wolbachia has. Um, here, the infected females lay infected uh, daughters. Those live, but the infected males are lethal and die during the embryonic stages. Okay? So only infected embryos die that are males. Females live. Uh, uninfecteds are quite fine. And this is an adaptation for uh, Wolbachia in many different arthropod species. This is a smorgasbord of butterflies and beetles and moths and um, pseudoscorpions and drosophila flies that all have this male killing adaptation. And Wolbachia can do CI in some species and male killing in other. Sometimes they can do both. And we wanted to know um, a bit more about what's going on here. And we ended up just walking right into it. Oh, the final point is male killing has these fascinating downstream consequences. Imagine if the phage and the Wolbachia are so good at what they do, they kill all the males in a population. What happens? Well, the females have nobody to mate with and they go extinct. And in species where there's lek mating, where females do the choosing of their male mates in a group, when sex ratios are biased against males because of male killing, such as in these butterflies, the whole scenario switches. And now the males become the choosy sex because there's less of them and they choose which females they want to mate with. So remember throughout this talk how these simple genes can really be contributing to major evolutionary processes such as lek mating. Okay, so Jesse's thesis was on this, and Jesse um, ended up working on this WMK gene. Here we're expressing WMK in the embryos, not in the parents, but in the embryos. Okay, so transgenic expression in the early embryos. And we wanna test, do the females live, but the males die when we express these? In parents, I can tell you right now, um, expressing WMK in parents does nothing, and there's no uh, sex ratio change. When we express in the embryos, you'll see that the sex ratio shifts under WMK, relative to a transgene, about 40% of the males die. Um, so we're not recapitulating complete 100% lethality, but we are doing a significant amount with this single gene. And cytologically, we looked for a lot of those same chromatin defects that we talked about with CI, the chromatin bridging, the embryonic arrest, and the males that die, um, that 40% that die, tend to also show that they are, they are dying associated with these lethal chromatin errors. Um, similar to the ones that CI caused. And then finally, we've been able to link the WMK um, effects to the dosage compensation complex pathway. And in Drosophila, the dosage compensation complex pathway is well known 
to upregulate X chromosomes in males' expression so that it equals female expression since females have two X chromosomes males have one, dosage compensation just upregulates the X chromosome in males. It's a male-specific phenomenon. Uh, and what Jesse showed is that, uh, first of all, this is just DNA stained in a WMK embryo versus a transgene embryo. DNA damage is then detected with this green stain here, this histone stain. And you can see that it's increased in males relative to females in the control. And then histone acetylation is associated with dosage compensation complex activity and you can notice how there's more acetylation going on in the male embryos, very little in the female embryos. And in fact, um, this acetylation is nicely correlated with the DNA damage marker over here. And that's what this chart shows here, that there's a link between WMK protein expression, DNA damage, and histone acetylation associated with the dosage compensation complex. So we really want to figure this out more. How is it that these products are are sex specifically killing these embryos and does it work through the dosage compensation complex pathway or not? The evidence seems to suggest that based on these correlative uh, approaches so far. Just to sum up then, so the, we started with the world's greatest animal pandemic, uh, Wolbachia, in which they occur in millions of arthropod species. A lot of that pandemic spread is due to these CIF-A and cif -B and WMK gene products that map to the eukaryotic association module of phage oil. Then these uh, phenotypes, at least, and now genes, if you will, are being used by many companies, commercial companies, as well as foundational uh, groups to reduce the burden of uh, arbovirus transmission to humans. And then also these genes have important impacts on downstream ecological and evolutionary consequences, such as left mating and speciation. So there's a lot of work to still be done. Um, and Brittany and Rapinder in the lab are, in fact, working now towards where are these proteins located in the reproductive tissues? What are their protein interactors? And how are they specifically modifying gametes or embryos in order to further understand the functional basis, the mechanistic basis of these selfish genes? Okay, a little bit of a big picture ending for all of the phage and virus folks, which is how important are phages in endosymbiotic bacteria? Typically, we think of phages as these are free living bacterial uh, elements. Endosymbionts tend to be streamlined of mobile elements. This isn't the case for Wolbachia and other endosymbionts. Inside this host cell is an endosymbiotic bacteria in purple, and then phages, and then this nucleus of the eukaryotic cell. How important is this? Well, for one thing, I think that the most common endosymbionts are likely to be subject to phage infection, a kill the spreader model. Wolbachia are so widespread in so many animal species, that foreign gene pools are just bound to encounter this Wolbachia element. And therefore, Wolbachia makes itself susceptible to mobile element or phage invasion. Chlamydia is another endosymbiont, intracellular bacteria that harbors phage. Uh, and it is extremely widespread as well. Uh, so it just may be that the most common endosymbionts shouldn't be thought of as different, but in fact may be subject to phage invasion. Lysis of, phage, lysis of the bacteria via the phage is going to be really important for endosymbiont densities, that is how much is in the cell. And then it turns out that densities of the endosymbiont often correlate with the strength of how these adaptations are expressed, or what we call penetrance. So phages lower Wolbachia densities, for example, they're going to lower Wolbachia's ability to cause CI and male killing. So there's going to be some sort of dynamic balance between the prophage expressing these products and then the phage making a living by spreading to other Wolbachia cells. Um, this is not unique, but it is uh, something to think about in the context of the work just discussed. Um, just like free living bacteria, prophage woe is a hot spot of genome evolution that carries these reproductive parasitism genes. And yes, there is lots of phage gene transfer in this endosymbiotic niche, in the niche we typically think to lack phage gene transfer. Um, we've documented one of the most uh, sort of extensive phage transfers, 50 kilobases plus. Um, that's the whole phage woe genome from one Wolbachia to another in a co-infected host. So this has led to us thinking about this intracellular arena hypothesis, or now it could be called concept because it seems to be borne out in system after system. That is that inside the cell, there is an ecological arena inside this host cell. 
There are intracellular co-infections of bacteria, like Wolbachia, that then exchange phages between each other. There could be facultative intracellular bacteria that come into the intracellular niche, seed these elements, or even exchange outward. That is another route of horizontal phage or mobile element transfer. And then finally, with the case of the latrotoxin, we also think that there's a novel form of metazoan to phage gene transfer happening inside the arthropod and Wolbachia case, and perhaps this is more common. We do not know the origin of the SIF genes. This is a big, in the WMK genes, these are big mysteries right now for us. Um, okay, and the final big picture thought is, remember that viral, virologists tend to classify viruses in terms of the three domains, the three cellular domains of life. Um, archaea viruses, bacteria viruses, eukaryotic viruses. And Sarah and Alex are now working on a project. Think about, you know, how does phage woe fit into all of this? It's clearly a, a phage, it's clearly a bacterial virus. But yet this bacterial virus is experiencing the eukaryotic cell. As soon as it leaves that cell, it's now in a eukaryotic environment. Um, what does it have to do differently? And maybe the eukaryotic association module is a form of the selective pressure for a phage that not only lives part-time in bacteria, but part-time in eukaryotes. And that's why it may have these cytoplasmic incompatibility genes, these male killing genes, but also insecticidal toxin genes, apoptosis and cell death genes. What if the phage is mediating eukaryotic cell lysis somehow as well? Um, so these are big questions that we think the phage woe system is really well set up to do. Okay, I'm gonna end here. Uh, I wanna just put a shout out to our education project where we reach high schools and colleges uh, worldwide. Athena and Sarah run what's called Discover the Microbes Within the Wolbachia Project. And if you know any schools that would like to get involved in hands-on PCR, um, gels, bioinformatics, and phylogenies of Wolbachia or phage genes, um, please check out the link. Been supported by a number of programs, um, training programs, as well as core federal grants and the Vanderbilt University Microbiome Initiative. Um, we've had a number of collaborators uh, and everybody else that I've mentioned with their pictures played a primary role in the work. Uh, so I will stop there and see if there's any uh, food for thought for discussion. Thank you very much, Seth. That was really excellent. I really enjoyed that. My pleasure. Should I stop the share or should we? Uh... Actually, yeah, stop the share for a minute. That sounds nice. Then we can all see each other a little bit more and we might call upon you to show you, show us your data again, but <laughs> let's good. see. That sounds really good. Um, so let me call my chat window back up. Um, I have been seeing some questions coming in and actually, why don't I invite the audience? First of all, let's have a round of applause for a really excellent and well-delivered seminar in a time we could really use it. <laughs> thank so. you so much. <laughs> My pleasure to be here. Um, thank you very much. And, you know, I would like to invite you, the audience, um, to unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, or if you would like me to ask the question, you're very welcome to put it here in the chat. And I have a few of those. And the first comment I want to make is um, an undergraduate from my course said, this is so fascinating, but I have to go to my lecture. Um, will you post the meeting recording somewhere? So yes, we're going to do that. Um, and um, OK, I'm going to read a question from Hui Pham Tuki, who asks, um, are there any current projects related to solving the structure of both CIF-A and CIF-B in order to real, reveal their biochemical mechanisms? That is a great idea. And it's something we've wanted to do uh, in the background of all the other things we're currently doing. Um, so it's been a little bit of a juggling of priorities. Um, I don't think that there are direct plans. Um, I think maybe folks have tried in the field and that we are building the resources to try um, with expressing the protein and having the ability to purify that protein and then get it to structure. So we're in the most beginning stages of that. And I don't know if others are, but it's so important to do so we can map genetic and protein variation of structure and the key areas uh, that affect CI and rescue and the way that the A and B protein map and bind to each other perhaps in order to cause CI. So great question. And I'm looking for collaborators if anybody's interested. Well, I'm wondering if Phoebe Rice is interested. She's, well, there's many crystallographers in the audience, I think. But um, I would like to ask a question that Travis Wiles, um, who's a new professor here at UCI, 
Um, he's just joining my department, actually, molecular biology and biochemistry. And um, he's very much a microbiome scientist who cares about phages. Um, and Travis and, uh, very well, yeah. <laughs> Travis Wiles asks a cool question about whether, um, is it known what regulates the woe-lytic lysogeny decisions, and if those are connected to CIF A and B expression? Super question. It's got to be relevant. Hi, Travis. We, we've interacted quite a bit. We've eaten Nashville hot chicken together, so I guess that's <laughs> good buddies. Um, and so we don't know technically. It's a little bit harder to do in this sort of nested symbiosis system because you don't have just a bacteria and just a phage on a plate. You have gotta do it with the host there. Um, so the crude things that we've done are temperature induction, for example, um, both high and cold temperatures can induce the phage into activity. Uh, but we don't know necessarily what the machinery underneath that is. Um, and so that's sort of the limit of the knowledge. But I completely agree with you that understanding the nature of that lysis ly lysogeny switch will be really important to better understanding when does the phage hold itself back in order to express the SIFs and WMK, and when does the phage just launch into a particle and lice and blow up the system in order to go find other Wolbachia to infect. Um, based on our TEMs, about 11% of the Wolbachia experience phage woe-induced lysis. Um, and if that's canonical, that is probably a pretty good number for 10% of the population to be blowing itself up to find new Wolbachia, and the other 90% using the prophage as a way to express these adaptive traits for Wolbachia. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, there could be a lot of more reductionist work done at that. Thanks, Travis. Great. That actually prompts me to ask a follow on question, which is just, is the evolution of the phages in the Wolbachia in a cell constrained? I mean, do you think that um, there's room for? drift based on this, the phages infecting just only the hosts within the eukaryotic cell? Like, is it, do people follow that kind of stuff about the phages in endosymbiotic bacteria? Yeah, I, I, I think there are restrictions, right? Obviously, this is not going to spread as much as a free-living bacterial phage would. But we can find evidence of phage woe in unrelated bacteria. Um, so Bartonella hensili is actually, it's an alpha proteobacteria like Wolbachia, but it's a free living or facultative uh, infection. It causes cat scratch disease and it clearly has remnants of phage woe in it. Uh, there are other smatterings across the literature of um, evidence of phage woe parts. There are also relic phages. So we know that the phages are there long enough to degrade and their genomes start to shrink and only essential regions can be, are held on. So for example, um, there's a case where 75% of the phage woe genome has been lost in a Drosophila wolbachia. The other 25%, where do you think that is? That's right in the EAM and it holds on to the CIF genes and WMK genes. And then there's, there's probably evidence and indications of reinvasion of phage woe back in as an intact phage. So these cycles of perhaps relaxed selection, uh, genome reduction of the phages, becoming relic phages, and then there's enough flow that there's always an intact phage present in um, a lot of the Wolbachia genomes we look at. That's very cool. That's interesting. Um, our next question actually comes from Sarai Finks, a PhD student in Jennifer Martini's lab in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. And Sarai, I invite you to ask your question, or would you like me to read it? All right, I'll read it. Um, so, so have you found Wolbachia plasmids associated with CI and is horizontal gene transfer evident within the Wolbachia populations? Great question. Uh, we used to think plasmids were, were not uh, evident in Wolbachia. Um, plasmids can be found in other endosymbionts. So the nutritionalist Buchnera endosymbiont of aphids carries a plasmid that encodes some of the essential proteins that are needed to fill in the missing amino acids of the aphid uh, diet. So they're not um, absent, but they're also not common. And we hadn't seen it in Wolbachia until about a year ago. I ended up collaborating with Amirat Aaron and Julie Revenalod, if I've got that last name, it's a long one. And we, uh, we ultimately found genomic evidence for a circular plasmid in Culex pipiens Wolbachia for the first time. It's genomic evidence. Um, it's common enough that we could detect it in wild samples. And one of our next questions is whether we could purify that out and use it as a, a vector, um, essentially using it for horizontal transfer of 
genes that maybe we could put into the plasma. We also have similar ideas for the phage, using it as a genetic vector for moving genes into Wolbachia. Um, so that's what we know. It's quite limited, but it does seem like the plasmid story, there's more to it than just that initial discovery. Thanks for the question. Yeah, good question, Sarai. Sarai cares about plasmids a lot, so I'm glad she got to ask. <laughs> well, come work on the system. <laughs> um, we have a question um, from, oh, Sarai thanks you. We have a question from Yeva Mirja Kanyan, who asks, um, regarding the parasitic wasps and transmission of Wolbachia, is transmission between the wasps limited exclusively to sexual transmission, or is there also a, the possibility for infection of an uninfected female during oviposition to a host that has previously had eggs deposited from a different infected female? Wow, you might want to read that question. <laughs> I'm just, I got it. I've, it's a great yeah. question. Yeah, it's a great question. Essentially, um, what what wants to be sought out there is is uh, you know can an uninfected host be infected by Wolbachia from another species, let's say, or another sibling, but through horizontal transmission. And the, as the question outlines, there could be possibilities of let's say if you're a host and you have Wolbachia and you're parasitized by something that's uninfected, um, could feeding on an infected host, for example lead to a transmission event of the Wolbachia to that uninfected prey or uninfected predator, and then that makes it to the reproductive tissues and then inherit it. So the short answer is yes, there is evidence of that. Um, the primary transmission route is through the germline, but on an evolutionary timescale, we can see cases of predator and prey that have exchanged Wolbachia infections in the recent past. And we think that that, that ecological interaction is perhaps meeting, mediating that. Within species, siblicide can also apparently transfer Wolbachia. So there are some cases where you put enough larvae into a host of wasps and the wasp larvae will start eating each other uh, for food. And uninfected larvae can pick up Wolbachia from infected larvae that they eat. That's another way it happens. These are all lab-based studies for now and the phylogenetic evidence is more natural-based. So there's enough anecdotal stuff to, to say that it happens, but not at the scale of how common vertical transmission is. Interesting. There's actually a related follow-up question. Um, also, are eggs deposited into a host from an uninfected female viable if the host already has had eggs deposited from a different infected female? Yes, indeed. That's, that, that's no problem. This, the lethality induced by the CI or the male killing um, is all sort of specific to the embryo that's experiencing those protein products. And um, they don't get uh, transferred, let's say, between neighboring embryos. Um, so yeah, that's quite fun. Yeah, it makes me think about just the biogeography of the phages in an organism because, you know, we that's a question we all have about phage therapy. Like, should we be taking it in through, um, you know, what route should we use? Injection, local application. If you do apply something systemically, will it get to where it needs to go? So that's already a little bit of an answer that if you eat the 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 Wolbachia, it can get into the germline. That's kind of interesting. I think it's amazing. I, I agree. I don't know how it happens. It's, I mean, the question is, you know, how does an intracellular endosymbiont move like that between species or even within species in a way that it has to go through the GI tract, survive that, then make it to the reproductive tissues, then get inherited to the next generation? Um, there's something there we don't know fully what's going on. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, well, I would I would like to invite everyone here. Feel free to turn your cameras on, by the way, if if you're comfortable. We can all say hello to one another. Um, if there's any other questions, we welcome them. Um, however, we are up on the hour, and also very important. Um, anybody who would like to stick around and talk is incredibly welcome. Um, we are planning to have a discussion right now with the four trainees who are supported by the Center for Virology. Um, however, that invitation is extended to anyone here who would like to get to keep talking science and having fun here. So you're all welcome. And uh, I just want to thank Seth again for a really um, nice presentation. Thank you. My thank pleasure. you very much, Seth. My pleasure. You're getting lots of thank yous in the chat too. <laughs> all right, moon pies for everybody, right? <laughs> I should have coordinated local delivery by Uber of moon pies. That would have been slick. <laughs> tough, tough to deliver 70 moon pies. You can do it, but. <laughs> <laughs>
You're right. For one of my um, students who defended, we delivered single serve champagne all around the neighborhood. <laughs> oh, that's nice. But yeah, I don't think moon pies go old. So, you know, we have to mail them. It takes a while. Shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> <laughs>